Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 8, Energy Expenditure During Rest and Physical Activity. This is Dr. Michael and this will be a quick lecture and review of chapter 8 content. Please keep in mind that any words or phrases that you see in the PowerPoint chapters um, that are bolded or look to be important, um, pay close attention to those. I will also let you know if there is something in the lecture that does not require close attention. Um, you are never expected to memorize or know graphics that you find in any of the PowerPoints. Um, so here we go. You can review the chapter objectives at the beginning of each slide. So your total daily energy expenditure, or you might see this abbreviated as TDEE, -E, is determined by your resting metabolic rate. So how much um, are you how much energy are you using um, really just by sitting there um, or laying if you have a sedentary lifestyle? The thermogenic influence on consumed food, or you might see this um, relayed as the thermic effect on feeding. Um, that's the energy that you use through digestion um, and body processes involved in, in digestion, etc. And lastly, what we most commonly think of energy expended during physical activity and recovery. Okay, so there's a graphic for you. If that helps you to learn um, the breakdown better than reading the words on, on a PowerPoint or on paper. Okay, so you're resting or your basal metabolic rate. Everyone has a different basal metabolic rate. Um, there are factors that influence this. Um, one major factor is the amount of muscle mass that you have. So what is your, your fat to muscle or lean um, to non-lean ratio? Um, in females, your BMR, basal metabolic rate, it tends to be 5 to 10% lower when compared with males in the same age group. Okay, so there's just another graphic for you. Um, so here is an equation to estimate your daily energy expenditure. Um, there are also multiple calculators that you can find online. I will go ahead and link one. Um, in our course module for you. It is something that you can do on your own for fun. You do not have to do it for this class, but it's actually kind of a cool thing to see and uh, learn a little bit more about yourself. So there will be various questions that are asked with these calculators. Um, some of them do differ just slightly, but that's something that I will link in class for you. Okay, so there are two equations for women and for men to predict your resting energy expenditure. This is just here for you to know um, so that you know it exists, you know where to find it. You're not expected to memorize these equations. Okay, so remember when I talked to you about bolded words, here's a great example of some of these things that you'll need to know. So physical activity accounts for around 15 to 30% of your total daily energy expenditure. Of course, that can vary depending on the type of physical activity that you do. I'll give you a great example. This morning I did some yoga and stretching and expended far less energy than I did yesterday when I did a total body lift. Um, you can feel it whenever you're working out, whenever you're performing activity, um, you can track your heart rate. So there are multiple ways um, that you can account for the amount of energy that you expend. Next, dietary induced thermogenesis, 10 to 35% of the ingested food energy. Um, so again, I talked about this a few slides back, the processes that your body goes through in order to digest the food that you consume accounts for a part of your daily energy expenditure. Um, the climate. So how warm, how cool are you? What is your core temperature? Um, there's additional energy required for sweat gland activity. Um, as well as different circulatory dynamics. And last but not least, pregnancy can impact this. So there's another chart for you to take your time and view. Again, you're not required to memorize this. So your energy expenditure during physical activity. Your body size plays an important role in contributing um, how much energy you are expending. Heavier people, um, whether it be heavier because of body fat percentage or muscle mass, heavier people tend to expend more energy to perform the same activity than people who weigh less. 
Energy expenditure can be predicted during weight-bearing exercise from body mass with almost as much accuracy as measure, measuring excuse me, oxygen uptake under controlled laboratory conditions. You've probably seen METs if you've ever been to a gym or fitness facility and used any type of cardio equipment. Um, you've probably seen something pop up that says METs. Um, what that is talking about is it's a way to rate the exercise intensity from a resting baseline. It's just a graphic for you. Again, here are some of those bolded words. Um, so mechanical efficiency, gross mechanical efficiency, net and delta efficiency. Um, just know the difference between each of those. Okay, so some factors influencing your exercise efficiency. And some of these you will recognize as things that we've learned about in HPE 431 or motor development if that's a class that you are required to take. So the work rate. As the work, rate of work increases, your efficiency will decrease. Um, and by work rate, you can also think of this as like intensity. So your movement speed. Any deviation from optimal movement speed um, will decrease your efficiency. So an optimal speed, for example, in a future slide you will see for walking um, is under a 4.0 speed. So running becomes more mechanically, it becomes more mechanically efficient to run once you get past four miles per hour. So any deviation from that optimal speed will decrease your efficiency. Extrinsic factors, so what is going on around you. For example, um, the book Sites, Improvements, and Equipment have increased efficiency in many physical activities. Next, what type of muscle fibers do you have? So if you're a type 1 fiber and you are more mechanically efficient at long duration or long distance um, endurance type activities, um, you are obviously going to be more efficient, say, running a half marathon than someone who is more genetically predispositioned um, to short explosive activities or those type 2 muscle fibers. Next is your fitness level. So individuals who are more fit will, of course, perform a given task at a higher efficiency than a non-fit individual. Body composition. Um, individuals with a higher body fat percentage tend to be um, lower efficient than individuals with less of a body fat percentage. And of course, technique. If you have good technique or proper form, if you're in any of the PE classes, um, the teacher ed uh, type classes, and we go over cues and proper form, you know that this is important for someone to be efficient in their movements. Walking economy, I'll briefly touch on this. I had mentioned in our previous slide that um, it is it becomes more mechanically efficient to run when you get past four miles per hour. Um, a linear relationship exists between walking speeds of three miles per hour to five miles per hour and oxygen uptake. Um, so the more you speed up, the less economical walking becomes. Again, some graphics here. You are not required to memorize these. They are only here to help you understand the content. Okay, so walking surface, of course, impacts um, your efficiency as well. So think about maybe walking on smooth pavement or smooth dirt or grass versus, you know, crumbly gravel type road. Of course, that's going to impact your output. Um, similar economies exist for walking on a grass track or paved surface. Um, energy cost almost doubles when you're walking in sand. Of course, if you've ever been to the beach, you know that's difficult. And is threefold when walking on soft snow. Um, living here, being from around here, I don't know if that's something many of you have experienced on a regular basis. Um, I'm from the north, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we definitely get more snow than here. Um, not as much as further up north like New York or up into Maine, but it is really difficult to walk when the snow is deep or when the snow is thick and, and not powdery. Um, I've actually done snowshoeing before one time because it was free, so I decided I would try it at a winter festival. And it was unbelievable how much easier it was to walk on the surface of snow when you had the snowshoes on. So very interesting. 
Um, footwear, of course, if you're an athlete, you know that certain types of footwear uh, make movements more efficient in certain activities. Um, I was never a big running shoe footwear person. I'm not a runner, just FYI, I'm not a runner. If you've met me, I've told you that, but I did buy a pair of walking running shoes from the brand No Bull, if you've ever seen those advertised. I thought I'll give them a try, and honestly, it felt like walking on marshmallows. It was fantastic, and it made a complete difference in um, how fast I was able to walk, how long I was able to walk. Um, so it, it definitely made a huge difference. So I'm a firm believer in appropriate footwear um, when needed and, and when it's available to you. It has to be financially available as well. So firm believer in that. So energy expenditure during running. Um, of course, we talked about becoming, you know, more efficient from walking to running. Now, jogging to jogging to running, excuse me. So jogging to running, um, a jog becomes a run technically at a speed greater than 6.5 miles per hour. Again, I've talked to you all before that tell you that I'm not a runner. I'm not even a jogger, to be quite honest with you. But if you are someone, I know a lot of people are very... Um, strict with their running and they have routines, this is something that you probably realized or can, can relate to in your own personal life. So the same total caloric cost results when running a given distance at a steady rate oxygen uptake at a fast or slow pace. Okay, running speed can increase three ways. Um, number of steps or stride frequency. Uh, the distance, of course, between steps or your stride length. Um, and an increase in stride length with frequency. So if you're a taller or a longer leg person, you definitely have a longer stride length than a person who is shorter or maybe has a uh, longer torso and shorter legs. Just a chart for you. Um, air resistance, of course, plays a big impact in, in running speed or even walking speed. Um, the air density, projected surface area, and the headwind velocity. So if you're running against the wind, of course, that play, that makes a big difference in um, the amount of energy you're expending, as well as the efficiency of your run. Okay, energy expenditure during swimming. If you're not a swimmer, um, or you're not someone who's ever, say, swim for exercise, um, it is... A challenging sport and if you're not used to it it is way different from running or even walking or jogging um, you can be an efficient runner and hop in the pool to swim laps and find that you are not as efficient of a swimmer so uh, energy is required to maintain buoyancy while you're moving through the pool through the water um, you need the energy to overcome drag forces or the water force that get in your way as you're moving through the water. So these are very small factors, but they contribute significantly um, to, the, to the amount of energy that you're expending when you are swimming. So I think this is very interesting. It requires four times more energy to swim a given distance than to run the same distance. And that ends our show, our slideshow. So if you find that you have any questions, Please feel free to reach out to me at any time. I'm going to link this into your module, and I hope that everyone has a great day.